A boy never gets over his boyhood and never can change those subtle influences which have become a part of him, that were bred in him when he was a child. These were the words of then Princeton University President Thomas Woodrow Wilson. Wilson had spent most of that boyhood from 1858 to 1870 in Augusta, Georgia. The connection between the president and the boy named Tommy all started in this bustling city by the Savannah River. Um, by the time the Wilsons moved to Augusta, it was really a thriving commercial area. People from the countryside brought their cotton here, a large inland cotton market. Uh, there were railroads that came from South Carolina and from the interior of Georgia that Wilson would have heard uh, as a boy. Uh, down the street, about a block away, was the Medical College of Georgia, the only college uh, like that in the state. Uh, and next door to that was the Academy of Richmond County, where young boys got a classical education. So the town that Wilson moved into was an important commercial center. On Broad Street, the Wilsons could have bought everything from Belgian chocolates to Irish lace to the Reverend Wilson's pipe tobacco. And it was a city of churches. Wilson's life was completely influenced by his religious beliefs uh, and the influence that his parents had on him growing up. He seldom missed church on a Sunday. He pretty much believed in predestination. I, there's an interesting story when, after he was elected president, someone who had uh, been instrumental in helping w with the election went to him and said, now you know you owe me a job and uh, because I was invaluable, I'm paraphrasing, but somehow they, they, they wanted to be clear that they were invaluable in, in, in his election. And he was indignant. He said, nothing could have, have prevented me from becoming president of the United States because it was God's will. In 1913, Wilson became the 28th president of the United States. But even before his candidacy for president, Wilson's career was already quite remarkable. His higher education began in 1873 at Davidson College, and two years later he attended the Presbyterian Institution, later known as Princeton University. With a completed Bachelor of Arts degree, Wilson went to law school at University of Virginia. There he became known as Woodrow Wilson, and honed his oratorical and debating skills as a member of the Jefferson Society. After illness forced him to leave Virginia, he continued to read law, pass the Georgia bar, and practice for a time. But he found it, quote, haggling and scheming, end of quote. He wanted to have an intellectual life, so he entered graduate school at Johns Hopkins University in 1883. Wilson studied with early leaders in the movement to professionalize the social sciences. That same year, he married Ellen Louise Axon, an accomplished artist from Rome, Georgia. Because Ellen was an educated woman, a cousin worried that she would never marry. Many men of that era didn't like smart women, but Wilson did. Well, he was smitten right from the start. He did consider Ellen his, his intellectual equal, and she probably was. Uh, she was artistic, she loved poetry, she loved literature. They could talk about that all day long. A year after marrying Ellen, Woodrow Wilson received his PhD from Johns Hopkins University, the first major research university in the United States. Uh, in fact, the PhD was a rather new degree in the United States, so Wilson was among the first generation of budding scholars. He published several books, one from his dissertation, Congressional Government. He became a well-known teacher and lecturer. Uh, in fact, one of his colleagues thought that Wilson was the greatest lecturer he had ever heard in the classroom. And his students appreciated him as well, sometimes uh, giving him ovations for the lectures that he gave to them. In 1902, Princeton recognized Wilson's leadership skills by making him president of the university. By that time, the nation was in the midst of a major reform movement known as progressivism. It sought to solve problems that had emerged as the country industrialized and urbanized. Monopolies, poor and unsafe working conditions, 
Overcrowding and disease in big cities were among many other problems that needed attention. Wilson embraced the ideas of progressivism and, as a result, became a rising star in the Democratic Party and governor of New Jersey. In 1912, his destiny took him farther than his early dream of a Senate seat. The nation elected him president. In his first two years in office, he supported lower tariffs, the breaking up of monopolies, and the founding of the Federal Trade Commission. He also reformed banking with the establishment of the Federal Reserve. In the last two years of his first term, Wilson turned to social issues. For example, he supported the Adamson Act, which limited the hours that railroad workers could work because literally they didn't want people falling asleep at the switch and causing accidents. He also supported the limitation of child labor uh, through the Keating-Owen Act, which limited the hours and the age at which children could work and used the Interstate Commerce Clause to enforce that. A boy never gets over his boyhood. He had seen children working in factories in the Civil War era and had undoubtedly seen factory children in the North in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Perhaps nowhere did Wilson's early influences manifest themselves more than in his foreign policy. By this time, the United States was a major world player, but the world was in turmoil. Just across the border, Mexico was in the midst of revolution. And in 1914, across the ocean, a major world war was beginning, with Germany at the helm. Wilson tried to mediate the European conflict and keep the U.S. neutral. He issued strong warnings against Germany's policy of unrestricted submarine warfare. Wilson said from the outset that this was a weapon which couldn't be used under the usual rules of war. And what they were doing, of course, was creating a blockade around the British Isles with submarines in which they simply sank ships coming to the Isles. So the choice was really quite simple. So Wilson, either the United States had to stop letting ships go to Britain, stop trading essentially with the British, or else they were going to have to be prepared to defend their interests on the seas. These were extremely trying times for Wilson. Not only was he dealing with a world conflict, but his wife, his companion Ellen, was slowly dying from Bright's disease, a kidney illness which eventually took her life on August 6, 1914. This event devastated Wilson. The following year, widow Edith Bowling Galt was introduced to President Wilson at the White House. Wilson took an instant liking to the charming and intelligent Mrs. Galt. His admiration grew swiftly into love. In proposing to her, he said, In this place, time is not measured by weeks or months or years, but by deep human experiences. When Wilson ran for re-election in 1916, it was on a platform of peace and preparedness. But on January 16, 1917, the secret Zimmerman telegram sent from Germany to Mexico was, thanks to British intelligence, intercepted and decoded. The proposal asked Mexico to become an ally of Germany, and in return, after Germany won the war, Mexico would receive territory lost to the U.S. in the Mexican-American War of the 1840s. War was now inevitable. On April 2nd, Wilson went before Congress. With a profound sense of the solemn and even tragical character of the step I am taking, I advise that the Congress declare the recent course of the Imperial German government to be in fact nothing less than war against the government and people of the United States. Neutrality is no longer feasible or desirable where the peace of the world is involved and the freedom of its peoples. A boy never gets over his boyhood. His first-hand experience of the Civil War as a child in Augusta remained with him. If the U.S. had to face the horrors of war, Wilson wanted a better world to be the result to use the war to make the world safe for democracy, for it to be a war to end all wars. 
In a January 1918 speech, Wilson outlined the 14 points that he believed would create a more democratic and safe world. The influx of U.S. troops and war materiel broke the European stalemate and helped bring an end to the horrific killing of trench warfare with an armistice on November 11, 1918. Wilson's hopes to see the 14 points in the formal treaty did not materialize under the Allied pressure for security and reparations. His 14th point, the League of Nations, did make it into the treaty, but the U.S. Senate refused to ratify it. On a campaign to put public pressure on recalcitrant senators, Wilson traveled 18,000 miles and made 37 speeches in three weeks. So his aim was to stir up a major public wave of sentiment that would overwhelm the Senate and really make it clear to them that they needed to act and to work to pass the treaty and agree with what he had proposed. Well, he drew big crowds. He was quite, a, he was a good speaker and he did in fact create quite a lot of public sentiment in favor of the treaty. Unfortunately, in October of 1919, Wilson collapsed in Colorado and was rushed back to Washington where he suffered a debilitating stroke. While he gradually improved, he never fully recovered and had to rely on Edith's help for the rest of his administration. He died on February 3rd, 1924, three years after leaving office. So what were the subtle influences that the boy Tommy Wilson of Augusta, Georgia, took with him to his career as Woodrow Wilson, scholar in the academic world, governor, president of the United States and leader of the world. Step into the world of young Tommy Wilson and you shall see. <laughs>